Brother Rob mentioned in his prayer the impact that the world actually has on us and it's essentially this subject that I'd like to talk about for a little while with you this morning. I first started thinking about this last December when those terrible events took place in the Connecticut school in the US. We actually had a brother and sister who visited us just a week or so after that from America and uh, we were talking about the event and uh, I suppose what was very impactful to me and probably to a lot of, of, of you here also was all of the talk that went on about gun control from America that followed that event. And it was really quite incredible to, to actually think about that for a moment. Now if I had called an Australian audience together uh, and said in the weeks that followed that Connecticut incident, should there be stronger gun control in America? The answer would have been a resounding yes, am I right? Everyone would have said absolutely, they need to take some action. But if you asked an American audience, you got a very different answer to that question. And what I would have really liked to be able to do at that time was to ask an Australian ecclesia that question and to go to the US and to ask a US ecclesia that question and just see whether there was any difference in the result of that poll. Because I think as believers we are incredibly influenced by our culture around us. We are impacted by the world in which we live and even by the country in which we live. The opinions, the views of people that surround us have a very large impact, impact on, on us and what we think. And we often see this as we travel overseas. We see it as we travel interstate. There are differences between the culture of Sydney and the culture of Melbourne or Adelaide or any of the other big cities in Australia and much more so if you go to overseas countries and this has its impact upon the believers in those places. Now some of those differences are, are simply not really important at all. Um, I guess they're simply part of the diversity that we can see amongst the body of Christ throughout the world. How people are is different in some cultures. And things like the preference things that result from that can be very different. I don't want to spend time on, I suppose, what I've considered these non-important differences today. The things that aren't really an issue at all. But there are other things that rub off on us from uh, the world around us. And these are what I would call critical differences. These are factors that are going to have a material impact upon our faith. And we can see examples down through history from the Bible of the impact of the culture that surrounded the people of God had upon them. They were influenced in their attitude and their behaviour by what happened around them. The impact, of course, of the Sodom culture on Lot and his household saw Lot fleeing for his wife his life rather, with just without his wife, with just two of his daughters, out of, out of what was obviously a very large group who went with Lot and his family into the city of Sodom. And of course Lot's wife preferred Sodom, not just to her faith in God, but she actually preferred Sodom over her husband as well. And then, of course, if we come a little bit later on in history, God gave multiple instructions and warnings to Israel about not taking on the behaviour of those surrounding them. And God didn't make those warnings. He didn't lay out those laws simply to make it hard for them. It wasn't that God just wanted to provide them with a few challenges in their spiritual life to keep them on their toes. It was because God knew that the culture of the nations that surrounded them would destroy them. And if they didn't make a very clear difference between their behaviour and the behaviour of those that surrounded them, they would suffer and fail as a result of it. And of course in the New Testament, Paul to relatively new believers in Corinth, who had recently learnt the message of the Gospel, needed to adjust their thinking to God's thinking. And, and Paul said to them, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 
For what righteousness has for what fellowship rather has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, was Paul's message to them, and his message to us today. I will dwell in them, God said, and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. <coughs> and I'd like us to consider for a while this morning how we, we sitting here today in 2013, are affected by the culture surrounding us. Are our views and behaviours here in Sydney based on the Bible or are we more impacted by what is happening around us? So I'd like you to think with me of, about what is impacting your views. What is impacting my views, my attitudes, my behaviour? What is it as we go into a new week that is really driving us? I thought perhaps it was worth going back to, to basics today because there's of course lots of things we could take from the Bible in looking at this subject. But I thought perhaps we'd go back to the Ten Commandments given of course by God to Israel under Moses because they teach us, I believe, an enormous amount about God's attitude and what he considers to be important. I do believe they establish principles that apply to all time and we need to continually remind ourselves about them to fully understand and appreciate Jesus and the message that he brought to us. It's been great um, at Sunday School in recent months because we've been focusing with the little children on actually teaching them the Ten Commandments so they can actually recite them. And we started out with a song which, which was actually sung at the, the last Adelaide conference. And the, the wording of that is actually quite simple. Um, the essential phrases it uses for each of the commandments is actually shown on the, on the right hand side there. You'll be a lot form, more familiar of course with the record from Exodus 20 of what the Bible says. But it picks out these little phrases which I think are really good in getting even to, into a very little child's mind what essentially the Ten Commandments are actually about. I think the challenge that we really face here today in our modern world in Sydney is the difference in attitude to those commandments between ourselves and those around us. So I'm going to ask you to, to vote on a couple of questions today. But I don't want you to vote for yourself, okay? I want you to vote for your colleagues at work um, your class at school, your uni faculty, the suburb you live in, okay? So please don't, I won't be holding you responsible for your vote here. I think we'd be taking it that you're voting uh, for those people around you. So, um, reminder, vote for those uh, who you come in contact with, not yourself. The first question I'm going to ask you to vote on, is it wrong to kill? And remember, you're voting for not yourself, but for the community generally. Put up your hand if you think it's wrong to kill. Or you think most of the community would say it's wrong to kill. Yeah, most hands gone up. Wrong, is it wrong to steal? Okay, most hands go up. Uh, what about this one? Is it wrong to dishonour mum and dad? <laughs> People are a bit sort of, you know, good. <laughs> Terrific answer. Yeah, you'll get good lunch today, I can assure you. Um, it's difficult to answer that one, isn't it? Because, you know, most of the population would say, oh, you know, honour and respect. Well, you know, it's not all that important, is it really? Um, what about this one? Uh, is it wrong to what would your neighbours have? Is anyone going to vote? I mean, we're very affected by that, aren't we? How much are we affected by that one? And what about this one? Is sex before marriage? Now, it might be worth actually asking those in two parts because it's just possible, and I think probably true, that there's a large proportion of the population that would actually say sex before marriage is not wrong, but some of those people would actually say that adultery was wrong because you've made a commitment to your partner, am I right? 
But that's a really interesting one to ask because you, we, you, you can see in the, in the past 50 years the shift in the community about that sex before marriage one and how it's actually changed quite markedly year on year until it's become very acceptable uh, for that to take place. So as I've said, if we ask these questions progressively at different times down through history, we would have got different answers to those questions from the audience. But it's worth stepping back, I suppose, for a moment, isn't it? And, and thinking about God's choice of those ten. Because I think to me that's really interesting. Of all of the things that God could choose as the most important ten commandments that he would set aside and, and give to the nation first and put them on stone so that they would remember and learn them, he chose the ten. Do we think about that? If we ask Julia Gillard, um, or even Tony Abbott, if you feel, you know, a, a little bit differently, to choose the ten most important commandments for Australian life, what would they come up with? Would they select <coughs> ten like that? I think some of them would be the same, but would most of them be the same? Or just a few of them? Let's think very quickly about each of them for a moment. With that thought in mind, if we were sitting today in the Parliament of Australia choosing the most important laws and we didn't have the background of God behind us, what would we choose? I think the introduction is really important when God actually gave these commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. God established himself as a God who showed love for his people and had actually brought them out of a very difficult circumstance and was giving them the opportunity for a new start, an opportunity for them to exercise their own freedom toward him. And that's, it's on that basis, the basis of God's love, God's desire, for a relationship with his people that he sets out these ten. And of course, commandment, chapter, uh, commandment number one, you shall have no other God, gods before me. The first commandments are all about God, aren't they? And really what it's telling us is if we get our relationship with God right, our relationships and interaction with other people around us will fall into place. That's essentially what it's saying to me. It will be so much easier to keep those later commandments if we get the early ones right. If we set God up as the very centre of our life, just like he wanted to be the centre of the life of the nation of Israel. He didn't want to be shared. And he doesn't want to be shared by us today either. One of the problems uh, Israel had was, was not actually stopping worshipping God. It's very hard to find an instance where they stopped worshipping God what they did try to do was to include all of the other gods alongside God. So it became one-stop religion in the temple. Yes, you could worship God, but they established all these other idols in the temple courts as well, so you could visit them all on your way past, on the way to the supermarket for shopping. God doesn't want to be shared by us. And we in our times might not worship Baal or Ashtaroth and or any of the other gods that Israel did in Moses' time, but we can put many things in our life before God. And of course some of those are on the screen up there, career, possessions, entertainment, even family. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he said that for a reason, because he knew that human beings always have this problem of what to put first in their life. And that's a reminder for us today too. The second commandment, it's quite a long one, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. I'm not going to read it all because I'm sure you know it quite well. What does this mean for us today? The real spiritual God doesn't want to be substituted with, by an inferior image of himself. He doesn't want us to box or limit him in any way. I think essentially this is what he was saying to Israel. He doesn't want us to make statues of him or Jesus. 
He doesn't want us to worship what he has made. He rather wants us to worship God himself. Again, an enormously important thing for us to think about because we can get ideas in our head and we can transfer ideas to those around us and to our children about what we think God is like. Are we limiting those thoughts? Are we controlling those thoughts along one avenue or another and not really seeing God as he needs to be seen, as he wants to be seen? The third one, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, um, for, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now there's an enormous amount of misuse of, of God's name today. Uh, some people use God or Jesus' name all the time to emphasise their point uh, or to express their anger or frustration. We hear it continually around us, so much so that very often we become accustomed to it and we don't even notice it either. So, you know, I guess I've put up the first way in which this commandment has applicability today is just basic swearing. But there's also another way that God's name is used. There are many TV shows, for example, and songs that use God's name, generally in a derogatory sense. There's a radio show, which some of you probably heard of, called Thank God It's Friday. It's not really about giving honour and praise to God. And then there's that very catchy song, um, thank God I'm a country boy, very much tongue in tree. Right through our, our society there are uses of God's name for various reasons, generally not because the person using them has any particular regard for God. It just rolls well off the tongue. Does this impact on us? Do we even notice it? Does it worry us in any way? Um, how do we think God actually feels uh, because to many people he's simply become a, a, a tag for a comedy show or a slogan for advertising. It's really dragging the reputation of God down, all of these sorts of things that, that surround us. But I think there's a third area in which we need to be enormously careful as believers because as servants of Jesus Christ, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can also misuse God's name in a similar way to the scribes and Pharisees who attach to God's original requirements their own set of rules and norms. Doesn't this also mean taking the name of God in vain? Matthew 15 says, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So this particular command I don't think just applies to, to things like swearing or using the name of God as a tag. It also means that we have to be, be critical, critically careful as believers to use God's name right. Because if people know us as servants of Jesus Christ, they will be very affected by the way we speak about God and the way we act. How we react when others are around us will be enormously important to them and they will judge God by what they see in us. And as people around us become less and less familiar with the word of God, the responsibility that we hold to show God properly to people around us becomes more and more important. It's something we really need to focus on because they will judge God based on us. Now, commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Of course, the, the, the fourth commandment does not absolutely apply to us today. I'd certainly agree that the strong requirements given in the law are uh, for the Sabbath day are not binding on us in, in these times but what about the principles behind it? God knows us. He made us and we need to give to some, some thought to, to why God put this commandment in the top ten. I think even the Australian Labor Party with its desire to do good things by workers uh, would have trouble saying that an enforced day off a week was an important enough thing to be in their top ten laws for Australia, don't you think? 
But God included this command for, a, for an important reason. He knew that as humans it would be very, very easy for us to spend every waking moment of our lives working, improving our homes, or even simply attending to the physical needs of our family. And God is telling us that we need a break from everyday life. But it was not just about a break for rest um, that you know we might like to think about at holiday times, you know, the banana lounge type of, type of break. If it was that kind of rest that God thought we needed more of, he, he could simply have programmed us to sleep a bit longer every day or maybe have a hibernation period like some of the other animals. He didn't do that. And when he asked for us to keep the Sabbath, he clearly wanted us to be awake and aware for that time of rest. So it wasn't the sleep kind of rest that he was after here. The Sabbath was about a rest for worship. A rest to provide time outside of the normal everyday things of life for God. Rest from normal life to have time for God. And that's a real challenge for us in this society today. A lot of questions for us to think about in relation to this commandment, perhaps more than any of the others really. These are some of the things that came to my mind you know, in thinking about making time for God. Where do we draw the line with our work? Do we allow it to take over our lives? Because we can easily put all of our time and energy into our career to the exclusion of everything else in life. Should we work every day, for example, no matter how busy we are? And what about shopping? Should we control when we shop? Okay, the shops are now open 24 by 7. You can shop online basically any time anyway. Um, I thought it was really interesting last weekend. Uh, Good Friday traditionally has been a time when very few shops were open. But what really surprised me last weekend, how Friday didn't seem to be very different to Saturday or Sunday or Monday, or very different for a lot of shops to any other day of the year. So our society is continually getting to the point where no day is special and you can do basically anything you like every day of the year. But what about us? Should we control when we shop? Something to think about. What about missing the meeting due to other things? Um, you know, outings, parties, sport, holidays, all kinds of things can come into our life. I remember one brother from England saying one day, it's amazing how people can get up on a Sunday and say, it's a bit rainy to go to the meeting today, but on Monday morning, same rain, but they kind of managed to get to work all right. It's something for us to think about. Should we encourage our kids to focus so much on things like the HSC, that they miss meetings, that they don't attend youth groups, that they don't do Bible readings? during that busy time of their life. I guess personally I've tried as much as possible to, to keep Sunday free and to try and plan my life a little bit around keeping Sunday free. So that, you know, we try not to do assignments on Sunday. We try not to do work on Sunday. We don't decide to paint the house on Sunday. But whatever it is you decide, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but but whatever you need to decide about your life, please consider the principles behind this, this commandment because I think they are as valid today as they ever were. Keep the Sabbath. Number five, honour your father and your mother that you day, your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. In our reading today, Ephesians 5 and 6, you'll notice that this was specifically referred to in Ephesians chapter 6. But you probably didn't notice because you didn't really know what I was talking about. But if you think back to Ephesians 5 and 6, there are so many of those Ten Commandments referenced either directly like this one or indirectly like a lot of the others in those words that Paul says. He talks about so many of them. So... If you can't bring those to mind, it's probably worthwhile sitting down later in the day and reading it again and, and noticing the references that keep jumping up out of those couple of chapters to the Ten Commandments. 
The one that's interesting here about this is that before the command on murder, before we reach stealing, before adultery, those things that perhaps we consider really important rules for our life, God inserts a command about honouring father and mother. And I think the attitude to family <laughs> life in our society is the most critical breakdown that we see that's taken place around us. Depending on the study, um, we're told that 20% of families are made up of a single parent. Um, as I said, depends who you listen to and what number you use. It's, it's not the way God wanted things to be. Oops, sorry about that. Not the way God wanted things to be. Um, it was God's intention that people would live with a mother and a father. And he established that at the centre of the human structure, the family, uh, with respect and honour tied around it. But we don't see much concern about that in Australia today. And as a result of that, because of, of what's happening around us, we need to work harder than ever in our own families and in our own ecclesias to, to emphasise and to build the focus on this commandment. Because God is telling us it's critical to our spiritual well-being. Commandment number six, you shall not murder. We're probably more comfortable about that. Um, Many of us would say that that commandment is not a particular challenge to us. But we mustn't forget um, Jesus' words, of course, in which he extended the way in which he interpreted this commandment. And it's perhaps that that we're, we'll get more out of focusing on today. I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And what Jesus was essentially saying is that murder begins in the heart. Murder begins in our attitude towards one another. And it's essentially that that he wants us to focus on in our lives. You shall not commit adultery. Again, how many of, uh, of us would say that Julia Gillard or Tony Abbott would include this in the commandment list for 2013? Very unlikely. Uh, our society's views on sexual behaviour have changed over recent years more than any of the others that we've looked at. Um, I was talking to a man at work um, some weeks ago. Um, his son had, had, you know, obviously finished year 12 last year and he headed off to school with his, uh, with his girlfriend. And interestingly, the father absolutely expected that his son and the girlfriend would have sex. There was no doubt in his mind that that was going to happen. And to be frank, he didn't even seem to, to try and encourage his son not to because he thought that was just unrealistic. So what he told me was that the discussion with the son prior to leaving uh, was not, had nothing to do with what was and what wasn't moral behaviour but about having safe sex and how to avoid pregnancy. And I think this is very common in, in our society today. And just looking at those, um, those stats are very scary. Again, a stat is a stat and you can find all sorts of stats, but whatever way you look at the statistics around people's attitude towards sexual behaviour, it is very different to the way the Bible promotes it. And as the community attitude moves away from the Bible-based attitude. Has our focus on the importance of sexual purity changed? Do we continue to take God's point of view or is it just something that we've become used to? Something we expect? Have we become more accommodating of it as we live in Sydney here in 2013? It's worth thinking about. And it's worth talking about with, with our children and our young people as well. <coughs> you shall not steal is perhaps the simplest command of all. If it's not yours, you can't have it. But the question that is not so simple for us to think about is what is our definition of stealing? 
Because many people would say around us, oh, look, I shouldn't take something that belongs to TJ, but, you know, if it's the government, oh, well, you know, we've got a lot of money. Um, you know, the tax law's been written for us to try and find ways around. Um, or it's a big corporation, you know, Apple's very large and it doesn't matter if I pinch some of their software because they're making an obscene amount of money anyway. So why should I actually pay for it? So we get people making definitions in their own mind about what is stealing and what is not stealing. And I think the biggest issue we have today is not about stealing per se, but actually ensuring that our definition of what theft is actually aligns with what God's definition of what theft is. And the whole area of copyright and software and the internet and all of those things is something that we need to consider as individuals and as a body in the way that we behave and live. Commandment 9, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. Commandment 9 is, is not just talking about speaking the truth in court. It's about our communication with one another. It's condemning gossiping. It's telling us not to talk about people behind their back or to assume that we know how people feel about certain issues. We mustn't lie, it's telling us, and we mustn't be loose with the truth. And I think really here there's this very interesting connection with the third commandment. God is concerned for his reputation in commandment number three. And he wants us to protect the reputation of those around us in the same way that we seek to protect God's <coughs> reputation. And I think by thinking about it in that way, it will make us a little bit more aware of how easily we speak sometimes and how easily we do drag down, knowingly or unknowingly, the reputation of those who surround us. Worth thinking about. And the final one, number 10, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbour's. And this commandment in the law would give the lawyers a, a great time, wouldn't it? Because it talks about attitude. It talks about expectation. How do I judge that you've coveted something? when you go out and purchase something. Very hard to actually determine. Our world in, encourages us to continually compare ourselves to those around us. It wants us to have, in fact, what they have. It wants us to lust after the nice <coughs> holiday that our, that our neighbour just had. Because it's all about sales. And the best way to encourage sales is to get everybody wanting something that everybody else has really enjoyed. And suddenly the market expands and, and it's great. But this is not God's way. And it's very different to the way our world operates. Totally different. And I think this commandment is another one where the difference between the unbeliever and their attitude and their expectation in life and the believer should shine out very, very brightly. So, what does that mean for us as we continue on in our life in 2013? What should our focus be this week? Keeping the Ten Commandments gives eternal life. Not keeping them will bring death and unhappiness. And we need to think about this very deeply this week. We need to take time to consider our attitudes to them as a follower of Jesus compared to those who surround us in this society. Let's rethink the basics of what God has asked us to do to, to challenge our thinking and our way of life. Not against what those around us think, but against these Ten Commandments. And let's examine again what is driving our conscience and, and our attitudes. Is it the long-standing principles of God or is it the flexible ways of a world which is bent on destroying itself? And as we take the bread and wine together this morning, 
we're looking at a man in whom these Ten Commandments came to love by looking at Jesus Christ and the way he lived and the way he behaved we see a walking guide to these Ten Commandments. 